Thanks for joining me for the Pray for Micah podcast. Be sure to like, subscribe, and leave a review, and check out my YouTube channel and follow me on social media. Pray for Micah Pod on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. And now, on with the show. Welcome to the Pray for Micah podcast. And now your host, Micah Chrisman. Hello, welcome to the Pray for Micah podcast, where we explore art, community, spirituality, and our cosmic significance slash insignificance. I'm here with my good pal, um, doing this virtually from Asheville to Kansas City, Kansas City to Asheville, uh, Overland Park, I should say, if we're going to be regionally specific, with my buddy and former boss, we'll get into that in a little bit, Reverend Jason Carl. And uh, yeah, it's good to have you on the show. Um, we also wanted to just take a minute to, yeah, recognize what's happened in Kansas City the last couple of days. So on the day of this recording, uh, this is now uh, a day and a half, almost probably closer to two days um, since there was a mass shooting in Kansas City during the Super Bowl uh, Chiefs um, parade in in, um, downtown Kansas City. Um, Yeah, we just want to say our hearts go out to the families of the victims. We know that at least one um, woman who was a DJ, um, a real community, um, um, just influencer, very prevalent, it sounds like, just unfortunately she was a victim and she was um, killed by the shooter, the shooting incident, along with 22 people being injured. So it's a pretty havoc um, event. Um, I just know I was on the phone with family and friends yesterday, last night. Um, I was at work and I just had gotten wind or saw something on social media about how there was like had been gunfire at the um, parade celebration. And uh, <clears throat> just didn't have time just because I'm not in Kansas and I wasn't. But then I started realizing all these friends and family were like checking in safe. <clears throat> and then I just started, oh, like this was like a major thing happening. And so thank God. I don't know. For me personally, I was just like really thankful that I didn't have any family or friends that I know directly know who were hurt. Um, but one of my friends um, back in Kansas City, his like one of his pals, that was his aunt who was killed. Hmm. Um, so it was just like really devastating to hear that for him and his friend. Um, yeah, Jason, and I just wanted to, we just wanted to stop and kind of acknowledge it. Um, we also thought about doing kind of like a nonviolent kind of like centering prayer kind of deal. And I asked um, who better than my guest who we had this scheduled for a couple of weeks, but I was like, felt appropriate to have you kind of lead us in just like evaluating our place and our culture and our worship of guns and military industrial complex and just everything. I don't know. We just wanted to take a moment to like kind of uplift the power of nonviolence and trying to speak into that a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. So you have, I know it was kind of off the cuff. I also asked him if he would do this like 20 minutes ago. So Whatever you the spirit leads, I will we'll just join you. Well, what I what I'd ask is let's take a moment and um, take a deep breath in, and know that the spirit of God is with us, and hold that because we need it, and then release that breath. And let us pray. Holy God, you give us visions of beating swords into plowshares and spears into pruning hooks. You show us that the way of peace is to be our way. But our streets run with blood and we are caught in the cycle of an an eye for an eye and We have all become blind. Heal us of our addictions to violence 
Help us break the cycle of blame and the pointing of finger. And give us humility enough to listen to the cries of those who are wounded and who are hurting and who have lost loved ones. And give us enough anger at the unending violence to work for your vision of a world where wounds are made whole. Amen. Amen. I'll, I'll just, well, I, and actually, I'll just say yesterday we received word because yesterday was not only Valentine's Day, it was not only uh, Chiefs uh, Sunday, it was also Ash Wednesday. Uh, and we received word about about what had happened as um, as I was preparing to preach for for two Ash Wednesday services, and part part of that ritual is that we say ashes to ashes, dust, or remember that you are dust, and to dust you shall return. And I think I did not get through that evening without shedding tears. Um, and I, oh, it, I'm so I'm so angry and I'm so frustrated at, and um, and um, and God is present with us in that. But I, uh, yeah, we got to get some stuff done. Yeah, yeah, and um, <clears throat> you know, it's just interesting. I, I hear you with like just the anger and everything, and. We have like a national problem with like mm -hmm. gun legislation, the lack thereof. And mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure if I'll be able to quote the facts exactly, but just I know in Kansas City, one of the things I believe Mayor Lucas did um, pretty early in his like tenor as mayor mm -hmm. was they like were successful in like suing a gun manufacturer in Missouri. Or like I think maybe it was closer to like <clears throat> Kansas City that was like specifically targeting um just yeah parts of like the city and like like selling guns and like promote like yeah. I don't know they were able to like it was just very targeted to like we want a, a proliferation of weapons <laughs> um mm -hmm. in the hands of people um who otherwise are struggling financially and we just know when crimes up or when when you know, there's lack of wages and livable wages, like crime goes up. And those people, I believe, 100% take advantage of it. And yeah, but also, uh, you know, the state of Missouri used to have conceal and carry laws, and they did away with that. And at the, you know, I just remember that that's, that's been some years now, but um, the police chiefs, both in St. Louis and Kansas City and all the I think, you know, they were all against that. They're just like, this is a big misstep. But the Republican legislators of Missouri were like, nope, we believe in your Second Amendment right to be able to just have a gun, carry it, conceal it, and not have to take a class or do anything with it. I don't know. So I, I get that there's a long road ahead to, you know, and there's been some great movement, um, in the broader sense of trying to restrict you know, magazines, um, uh, you know, all the bumper stocks and all the whatever cosmetic parts of the gun legislation. But it's just silly to me that uh, it, yeah, it's just taking it, this long. And we just, yeah, it doesn't matter if it's kids who are, I mean, that's what broke my heart. Just hearing like, these are kids who go to a parade to see their team celebrate their, their with their families. And this happens. Yeah. And unfortunately, it's just like a it's a terror now that we all like I didn't grow up feeling that way going to crowds or things, you know, first it was like, I'm nervous of going places in big places because of COVID now. And that was like a thing I wasn't be before COVID. But right. now it's genuinely like I was at a conference for a work thing uh, last week mm -hmm. in Nashville, Tennessee, There was mm -hmm. like 3000 people. And there was just there was a moment I'm looking around this room. I'm like, all right, is this the kind of is there gonna be a mass shooting here? Like, could there be it was kind of a yeah. Sad, the, the, sad. Thing, yeah. the thing that angered me the most was what the thing that angers me the most from yesterday 
is as I was sitting there, uh, like looking looking at my news feed, I realized that I wasn't shocked or surprised that this was hap- that this had happened, and I I am so angry that that is a change that has happened within me, um, and. Yeah. and um, because I'm not surprised anymore. Mm-hmm. Um, and and I yeah, I, I I'm still angry, but I'm not surprised. Sure. Yeah. yeah, there was that weird moment where when I didn't know what had happened, I was like, <clears throat> my first thought was like, awesome, oh, like dumbasses, like got into it, a fight or something, and someone pulled out a gun. And it was like. Again, the same kind of thought, like, probably I'm not surprised that, like, there would be a gunshot violent thing happening in Kansas, you know, Kansas City. Yeah. But then I was like, oh, shit, like, things went down and, like, I'm seeing oh. my cousins and people who were there. And I'm, like, calling them and making sure I'm, like, holy, like, my brother, you know, I'm just like, is everybody okay, you know? And yeah. it's just my, my uh, brother-in-law and my brother-in-law and nephew were down, were downtown. We had a couple members who were, um who are downtown they were they weren't in the area but yeah you have the i remember having this moment because earlier in the day i'd seen everybody on facebook hey we're at the parade woo! and then you're like your heart just goes eh. yeah um, yeah well um yeah i'm sure there'd be a longer portion of a conversation yeah. to be had about it and um unfortunately i also feel like i'm also just tired of that part of it you know like the thoughts and prayers you know tots and pears and (laughs) and then oh let's have a legislation oh like biden coming out and base you know saying this i mean just it's the same talking point same thing and the the right's always like this is this is not the time it's too soon a tragedy's occurred you know and it's just the cycle just it 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 is just the, this this is a predictable this is a predictable cycle of conversation and uh and i because eventually somebody's going to start blaming um somebody's going to start blaming that somebody uh that somebody with Poor mental health was mm-hmm. was involved in this. That's that's one of the the frequent conversations. Uh, another person will be like, "Well, you know, it's an isolated incident." Although I don't know how anybody can hear that and take that seriously at all anymore. Um, yeah, I, I read something was like, "This is now the forty something mass shooting already this year." I'm like, yeah. "It's not even March," you know. Um, it's just... <clears throat> the thing that I shared last night, uh, one of the things I shared last night is that fundamentally the issue we have, we have sections of, of our country that want to tell us that there is not a problem or that the problem is really minor or that it's not important. Um, and I do not see how you can say that when when we have multiple ambulances running through the streets, uh, when we have people getting trampled and, you know, my daughter goes to school where kids um, were at the parade. And as she said, she, she was on her way to school today. And she told me, I'm prepared to give lots of hugs today, um, which on one hand, I'm, I'm proud of her. Um, she wants to be there for her friends, but at the same time, uh, she should not have to be that person. Um, I'm right. proud that she is, but um, yeah, we just yep. really appar- apparently we do not. Hmm. We care more about fighting about it. If, this is what it feels like to me. We care more about fighting about it than actually addressing it. Right. Um, totally yeah and then just yeah the solutions that are presented like i i saw at one point there's like a company that has like 
they they basically build and sell like uh, bulletproof sleeping pads like for like kindergarten classrooms and it's the craziest shit i've ever seen like yeah. like basically it's a it's a sleeping pad but it can like you can roll over and like pull these little like these little straps that, like recess into it but you can like and like basically they're trying to train kids to like w- kind of like put this sleeping pad on their backs and like walk in a single file line so like everybody's you know, I don't know who's at the front. The guy said they weren't on the front. I don't know. It's just like, all right, we're just gonna have to like arm teachers, and what? when we go to parades now, we'll just have to all have our like bulletproof sleeping pads on our backs, like our and, friends, you know. And and the thing that drives me nuts is it is this this idea that we're helpless in the face of of evil, and there there's nothing we can do about this. When the reality is. We will, will we ever be able to eliminate violence within our, our society and culture? No, of course not. Sure. But we can take a step and we can take a lot of steps to try to mitigate that. And that mm-hmm. it's, it's not just, uh, you know, restriction of guns. Um, although that's, how, that's gotta be a part of it, but improved mental health care. That is absolutely yeah. gotta be a part of it. It, it means in, it means a better deployment of our social services mm-hmm. um, to make sure that our to make sure that those who are on the margins um, know that there are people there. And, and actually, I will say our churches, you know, speaking as a as a Presbyterian pastor, we have a role about Jesus says some very, very explicit things about. And his actions demonstrate how the people who are on the quote unquote outside are supposed to be the ones that we are engaging with primarily. That's that's who we need to be reaching out to, not to help with charity, but to be in community with uh, with them. Um, And and there are a lot of I know many, many faithful churches everywhere that are trying to do that work but i think too frequently we try to pay other people to do that work rather than actually being willing to do that work ourselves and i'm as guilty as that as as the next person um but no but you're right like same thing with like police and stuff like we expect them to be now you know marriage counselors uh mental health experts and and you know like whatever uh, they they and, they have to do all of it and it's just absurd that like <clears throat> we right. just won't I mean, I, take care of well i had this one i was at this conference where we were doing this these conversations and there's this police officer who who was frustrated with faith community leaders who kept like uh who 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 were badgering him about you know people being doing this and he looked at me he was like you know Two weeks ago, I st- pulled somebody over and they tried to stab me with a knife. Wow. Right? They were speeding. They were drunk. Like, those are the work conditions that, I, that I'm in. And yes, like, he was like, you guys don't, he told me, you don't get what it's like to have to try to do everything. To which I said, I don't, I've never had anybody attack me, but I do know what it's like for everybody to expect you to do everything. <laughs> sure. Yeah, because your man, yeah. you've got a busy, busy life going on, you know? It is busy. Family and everything that kids growing up. Oh, Let's, my gosh. This is now the time to probably go ahead and just, you know, yeah, do, do our formal introduction. And yes. Let's get to know who Jason is and we can jump into all the crazy hecticness that you are all in. So Reverend Jason Carl serves as the pastor of Overland Park Presbyterian Church, where he has dedicated the past 14 years of his ministry. He is uh, happily married to Melissa Carl and together they are blessed with two children, uh, Rosalind and Sam, originally from northern Wisconsin. Reverend Carl's upbringing took an adventurous turn when at the age of 11, his father, also a Presbyterian pastor, uh, was called to serve as a missionary on the island of um, Mauritius, 
I don't know. Mauritius. That right. Mauritius. Mauritius. Got to got to get the sh in there. Mauritius. Uh, Mauritius. Mauritius. <laughs> in the uh, Indian Ocean. Uh, the Carl family spent five years on the island before returning to the United States and settling in Blue Springs, Missouri. In addition to his passion to open um, an inclusive ministry, uh, Reverend Carl has a penchant for video games and intricate tabletop games with thick rule books. He embraces a wide range of interests, exploring activities often associated with the term geek, and he takes pleasure in trying his hand at various geeky pursuits. <laughs> He was also America's top most epic boss ever on record to have ever supervised Micah Chrisman himself. <laughs> it, it was my uh, honor and pleasure. <clears throat> yeah, here. Uh, cheers to being the most epic top, you know, boss there, there ever uh, that ever supervised me. <laughs> cheers to being my favorite Micah to have ever employed. <laughs> It's like what my mom always says, you know, with like all the series. Like, Mike, you're, you're my, you're my favorite eldest son. I'm like, of course, that's how, that's how these things go. Yeah, that's I'm how the best. You don't want to hurt the other, you know, employees you have. I get it. Well, hey, cheers. We, we we have a little whiskey. Cheers, what are you Micah. drinking today? I'm drinking uh, um, scotch. Nice. I'm doing a little little Irish whiskey. So we're just two sides of the channel battling got, it out. Um. <laughs> I've got my pinky up because I'm fancy. Oh, that that sounds risky. Actually, <laughs> I, I don't. I don't want to. I'm, I'm too. I'm too precious okay. with my alcohol. I can't. I can't spill a drop. So I. I use all fingers wrapped around the box. In fact, I. I thought about doing the most of the time when I'm drinking a, a whiskey or something. I just. I want to do the the Trump thing where I like I'm holding the water bottle with two hands and just, just like gingerly. Yep. <laughs> yep. <laughs> I hear it. Never want to waste. Never want to waste. <laughs> well, <clears throat> yeah, we basically met um, fortuitously when I was living at Cherith Brook Catholic Worker um, in Kansas City. Shout out to my Cherith Brook peeps. Whoop, whoop. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> and I was They're living great with them folks. Time. Yeah, incredible. And Jason's church, they have they would go out there and uh, volunteer and doing like Saturday work days and um, yeah, just we we always had a good time. But I didn't meet him at Cherith Brook. I actually started. No. I found your job posting. I think on Indeed. I was kind of like yes. looking for contract work for communications marketing stuff. Yep. And uh, I like went and talked to Eric at Cherith Brook. You know, he, he was the person who founded the place. And I'm like, hey, you're a Presbyterian minister, aren't you? And he's like, yeah. I was like. Hey, there's this church. You do you know this guy by chance? You know, or do you know this church community <laughs> in Overland Park? And he's like, Yeah, we're like basically on the same, like, you know, local, regional, whatever, whatever you all people Presbytery. call it. You're, Presbytery. Yeah, the, pres the, the Presbytery, you know, your little your little cult circles, you where you wear the robes yep. and go and you go and you decide all the presbytery things. <laughs> we don't wear robes. I show up in well, jeans. <clears throat> To the That's, disappointment of many. Yeah, I was kind of disappointed. I thought, again, I grew up Baptist, so anything other than that, I was like, is this like a quasi-Catholic thing? Am I about to go and like get some real cool medieval experience stuff? And like, no, we're mm. actually just normal nope. people, Micah. Like, uh, <laughs> normal men? Yeah, the, the, the thing that is hilarious, you go to a presentary <clears> meeting, <throat> you think it's going to be awesome or culty, and it's actually <laughs> just Robert's Rules. Just Robert's <laughs> rules. It's actually, it's just very like governmental. It's, it's like we just have very corporate. We actually we, just no, 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 not corporate. Take, it's take the process. Minutes. Process. We, that's yeah. right. It's process. You, you, re, you record those minutes, treasurer. That's right. And all the... <laughs> not the treasurer. It's the clerk. <laughs> okay, whatever. I, you know, I don't know. At some point in college, I was part of a, you know, one of those things, and I, yes. I think I, I ended up being. The marketing person for it i don't know it was fun but yeah i just was like that was my one real brief brush with robert's rules <laughs> i was like oh this is a thing so it's funny to hear that churches we just like we just follow that you know yep i don't, I don't know who this robert guy is he doesn't sound like jesus though he doesn't sound as important <laughs> uh, uh sadly there are some 
potentially within our denomination who might think that Robert's rules might be might be just They're actually a little bit more below, <laughs> slightly below Jesus. We got the word but, of God and then we got we got Robert right here. We just, got Robert. Just, just a, then like Paul. Then Paul and, right yeah, then, then Paul. Yeah, then Paul, the rest of the people are just like kind of just li- slightly lower than the Robert guys. Yeah. <clears throat> Well, uh, Jason, tell us, uh, yeah, um, yeah, just a little bit about your faith journey. Like I said, it was fun working for you. I mean, I don't know if it was quite a year um, before I oh, started another full time gig. Was it over a year? A year no, and a half? it it was like I think it was close to two years because you got you helped us get through COVID, like the That's that right. first part of COVID. It that must was. Be, it just was weird timing. I'm like, I or oh, I don't I'm like wait. That whole thing, that whole phase, that whole era was a blur. So I'm like, wait, did I work a whole year? Yeah. I can't remember. Oh no, you. I think you were actually there close to two years because, um, yeah, I think you were really close to two years. Um, okay. Yeah. So my my faith story, I such it is it such as it is. I I grew up the the eldest son of a Presbyterian pastor. Um, in northern Wisconsin, and Micah also knows my parents uh, because yep. they also volunteer out at at Cherith Brook. Um, and always doing so laundry. The thing that you need... Oh yeah, always <laughs> doing laundry. My parents are, um, they they were part of the the left church in the '60s. So dad dad got in trouble and nearly got kicked out of college while he was. Um, as a um, anti-Vietnam War protester, like he, he did, he was active in uh, uh, working for civil rights movements in the early '60s. Uh, my understanding, this is this is lore, and if he hears this, he may just kind of shake his head and tell me that I got it wrong. But basically, he went out to Berkeley to uh, go to seminary there but was working so much with the Black Panthers in Oakland that he near that he basically just about flunked out. And that is some badass shit right there. Holy yeah, cow. No, like so so like my back like my background. People who don't know, don't always, share your parents' names just so that everyone oh, knows. Oh yeah. Uh Joe Carl and Becky Carl. Um they can be found at this address. No, I won't do that. You're um like- they were part of the Black Panthers. Where they immediately get like, just like I mean, it's kind of far, far old news. I don't know if anyone's far, gonna be cutting them down news, or yeah. FBI. I think the FBI stopped messing up, <laughs> fucking around with the Black yeah, Panthers. We'll, back see. Then. we'll see. I don't know. Now they're just moving on. Black Lives yeah. Matter people, right? <laughs> just like, yeah, sabotaging their work. I'm sure. Anyways, that's some badass. That's crazy wow. that he was involved in that in Oakland. No. Well, and so, so dad, well, and again, the thing that he was involved in was like the Black Panthers. One of the things that they were involved in was uh, meals for, for kids uh, before right. school and organize. Like, and that was the kind of work that dad was really involved in. That's how he got, uh, how he moved into that kind of thing. And so, um, it, and then we, we were up in Northern Wisconsin um, and while we were living up there, uh, you know, the end of the Vietnam War came, and we had all of these refugees who were coming from Cambodia and Laos. And we, uh, my parent, like one of my most formative experiences, is my parents basically adopted or or brought this young man into our house, and he had been forced to be a child soldier uh, in Cambodia. Oh, wow. um, and uh, so he came and lived with us and uh, stayed with us probably about six months or so. Um, his name was Boontoon. Uh, he lives up in Duluth uh, and I think owns a car dealership and uh, married, has children of his own. But that all of that was wow. like I remember that, that was really clearly important. And so if my faith is any it was is grounded in anything it's it's this kind of um advocacy is, is central yeah. to to your faith um making sure that people have access um and then dad got a phone call from the mission board of PCUSA 
and said, hey, would you like to go to Mauritius? And he said, wow. I would. Where is that? <laughs> and... Or he probably was better than me. At least he probably like knew what how it said. Nope. I'm like, where is Meritius? Well, <laughs> no, where well, is Ma Matthias? <laughs> well, and for context, for people who 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 very understandably may not have heard of Mauritius, it's the only place in the world where the dodo bird used to exist. Wow. So okay. So that's crazy. That's, that that that's the thing that I tell people to give them something to latch on to about about it. But yeah, we were there for um, for five years. Um, Dad's work as a missionary was not so much. It was not the the thing that most of us think about when we hear missionary, where you're going out to to the poor benighted heathens and you're going to to save them all. Um, by the time that my my father arrived, the church was essentially. Um, it, it was grassroots. Um, like they had about seven congregations and the, the national church of PCUSA re realized that it really made a lot more sense for us to be, uh, to provide education for Mauritians and um, make sure that they're, they're trained well, that they have, you know, biblical ex exegesis, like how to read scripture uh, you know, reformed theology, all of that. And so dad's job was to go and see if he could tap somebody who might be willing to come to the United States, receive an education at one of our seminaries, and then go back and serve their people. Um, wow. and, and so, yeah, so, so his, his, we got there, um, and and it was so Mauritius is it, no one thinks Mauritius is a hardship assignment, right? It's a volcanic island um, in the tropics, white sandy beaches, uh, dormant volcano. So you could go mountain climbing in the morning and in the afternoon, you could go swim in the ocean and the coral reefs and never ever once did I ever skip school and do that. <laughs> Sounds like you're really suffering for the Lord out there, you know, <laughs> we're really just, man, if, if only, if only Paul and them could see me now, how struggling. <laughs> it, no, that sounds well, magical though. And you know, oh, it, being, it and was... then in, I'm sure the culture and stuff, what was it like being 11 years old or being that young involved? That. Yeah. So, um, well, before we went to Mauritius, the, the church sent us to northern Quebec to learn French because uh, that's the language that most people. Uh, well, that was one of the languages that that was spoken there. And so we spent nine months there. That that was rough. Sixth grade. I was in a class where no one spoke any English. Um, and uh, but within nine months, I could pretty much speak French. Wow. Yeah. That's full, cool. Total immersion. Um, and then we got to Mauritius and it was, uh, it, it was beautiful. Like it is a beautiful, beautiful place. Um, Mark Twain, I think wrote, uh, that God created Mauritius first and then modeled heaven after it. Um, oh, wow. it just has, it just has this beautiful, wonderful natural beauty, um, and and the people the people are are lovely and loving. Um, one of the things that is that's truly amazing about Mauritius is so population wise, we have about it, it, there's about sixty percent of the of the folks there are Hindu. Um, Another fifteen percent are are Muslim, uh, about one percent are Buddhist, and then the rest, however much that is, because I'm horrible at math, <laughs> uh, they're they're Christian. The majority of them are Roman Catholic. Um, okay. And so there is this wonderful, wonderful religious multicultural diversity. So on Sunday mornings, um, the shop right across the street from us was closed. 
And so it, it took us about a, uh, there was a mile circuit that you had to walk to go get bread in the morning. And of course the children were all sent out to go do that. Uh, but <laughs> so in walking that, that mile, I would pass the Presbyterian church, uh, uh, a mosque, a Roman Catholic church, and a temple to the Hindu god Ganesh, the elephant god, uh, the god of wisdom. Um, and, and one of the things that is really remarkable is that these religions all make a point of learning about each other. Like with, there's a, there's a, mm. while I was there, I, I don't, I, I haven't been back in, in decades, but while I was there, there was a real intention of making sure that everybody understood the tenets of everyone else's faith. Um, mm. Not, not as, not in a way of conversion, but as a way of controlling misinformation. Um, like, and everyone had to learn that. Like that was part of elementary school education. Um, so I grew up with a, a, a really deep appreciation, not only of, not only of my own faith, but also the faith of other people. Uh, and from an early age, really learned how to how to accept that. Yeah, I'm curious. By having so many different faith neighbors, did mm -hmm. it like ever make you question the worldview or the faith, you know, constructs that your parents were trying to like, I hear that there was a deep respect that everybody had mm -hmm. for each other. But I guess I'm just curious, was ever like, when you were a teenager going through your rebellious phase, you're like, no, I'm gonna start worshiping Ganesh, mom and dad. You know, like my well, Hindu friends I, are actually way cooler. I don't know. <laughs> like, <laughs> well, I I will admit there for for a while I was I was very deeply intrigued with Islam. Actually, like mm. the 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 intentionality of how they practice their faith of uh, of Ramadan. Um, I I will admit, and, and again. I, I am I can be as shallow as the next person. The fact that during Ramadan, uh, Muslim kids were excused from hoeing in the garden uh, in the in the uh, in the sunlight because they couldn't eat or drink. Um, that that was kind of like, well, I don't really want to be hoeing in the garden for our agriculture class. <laughs> Um, Mom and Dad, this is lame. My, my friends don't have to do, you know, there's they're, they're, they're right. yard work. They're, Everybody they're else is getting chill. <laughs> their spiritual life lets them. I don't have to make my bed. No. It's Ramadan, Mom and Dad. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, but I will, say, I will say the thing, the thing, though, that really... Um, that always drew me back um, was a, I could not escape the, I could not escape these two realities. A, um, my parents were cool. Um, mm. Yeah, like, we, we all got that. Yeah, they're super yeah. cool. Yeah, they're right. like, my dude, parents they're were the cool. most badass like, parents. If I were to, if I were to <laughs> rebel against them, I'd, I'd have to vote straight ticket Republican or Libertarian. <laughs> And get like a really corporate job of being a lawyer someplace. <laughs> and um, <Lame. laughs> right. I, I could like that 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 would be rebelling in my household. <laughs> um but the the other thing that I really grew to appreciate about about my own faith of be, being Presbyterian, being Christian, um well, actually, being Christian was I could not get I, I could not escape the beauty of the idea that um, that God, the creator of the universe, um, became incarnate and came to be and share our lives um, mm -hmm. and our death um, that and, and that has been a that just keep it's it's kind of like that um i feel like in my own life of faith as i walk kind of in a circle 
I just keep coming back to that as I get deeper, as I go deeper and deeper into, um, into this. And, and I find that it has continuous real relevance, um, not only for my spiritual life, but also for how I interact in the world. Um, that, yeah, that, it, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, sorry. Sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt you. You were you finishing up that? I, I was. I probably was, you. but I'm old enough now. I'm old enough now that it's I already to, gone. You know, I've already. I, I, I broke. I broke your train of thought. Damn, <laughs> it is now officially broken for the rest of the night. No, I just was. I was kind of <laughs> curious. I was like, because <clears throat> it's um a little bit different than the evangelical upbringing that I had. That was very like, we were out here in these streets. You are, you know, we can't even tolerate the idea mm -hmm. that maybe there's gonna be catholics who go to heaven you know it's like no nah, we gotta like uh, most well, catholics i didn't say are that probably, i didn't say probably that. Going to hell. yeah no yeah that's my point <laughs> oh you're like actually the catholic they probably are going to hell uh no actually I, I i believe that since i consider myself more of a spiritual person i like the whole family guy meme that's just like god just like you know talking to peter and he's like peter's like wait i like you know, the gays going to hell? Like, no, they're not going to hell. He's like, what about people who say they're spiritual? Straight to the bottom. The worst part. <laughs> like, God's just like, <laughs> actually, he's like, no, most of the people, most of the roads, they're all getting to heaven. But people who are spiritual, they're they're going oh. all the way to the bottom. <laughs> like, the most torturous <laughs> chambers. Like, that's why I, I just think it's that. there. It's their, insu <clears throat> it's their insufferable uh, self-indulgence. Uh <laughs> right. Yeah, it's the rocks that they're putting under their pillows, you know. God's right. just that, like, that... I made those; they're cool, but also they're not doing shit for your head. I don't know. Anyways, I just think it's funny. Like, I like the idea that like I'm still gonna go to hell, you know, because God's just like eh, those spiritual ones. They they're going straight to the bottom, you know. No, but that's, I, I guess that's I was... not where you're going. <laughs> Wherever it's going, uh, it's not there. <laughs> but I guess I'm just curious, like. um, like I said, you, you know, was there ever like a point where, um, was it more of like communal? Like, I guess, what was your quote unquote mission? Was like, I know it's the sh probably build community, share the love of God there, um, in Mauritius, but mm -hmm. was it mainly just like be serving the local Presbyterian church and like have conversations with people who are interested? Or was it like, no, we have to go on Saturday morning and try to like, proselytize or i don't know i guess i was just curious like, was there like a no any see, element of that a lot of no there was not again like this see and this is this is one of the things that it's for for presbyterians um the way that we refer well okay my favorite way to refer to what a pastor is supposed to do is that we're supposed to be teaching elders uh we have teaching elders and ruling elders and so the primary role that I have, the primary role that my father had was that of being a teacher. And so right. there were classes that he would teach. Like they, they had like a, a, a lot of what he, a lot of what, what my father has always done. A lot of what I do is, is spent with the idea that we're, we take a deep dive into the word. Um, yeah. We, we try to think uh, critically and um and thoughtfully about uh, about what are the consequences of well for me it's what are the consequences what does it actually mean that i believe that god took human form and walked alongside and breathed my breathed the air that i'm breathing and how does that and ask the question does that actually make a difference um I think it does, but yeah. you know, I'll, I'll, now I will say, Dad got charged with heresy because he didn't damn people, di didn't damn uh, Hindus for to hell. Uh, he said, "I hope that Hindus are the best Hindus that they can be. I hope that wow. that Muslims are the best Muslims that they can be." And uh, someone in the church did not like that because evangelicalism is something that is right. worldwide. Um, and, um, and basically the charge was, uh, you know, you're not, you're not condemning these people to hell. And my dad's response, because 
we are Presbyterian, so that means we're Reformed, which means that we're the great, 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 great uh, illegitimate grandchildren of John Calvin. So we believe that God is sovereign and that it's God who gets to choose who's going to heaven and hell, not me. That's above my pay grade. Sure. Um, so, yeah. And he was acquitted of all charges. Oh, well, that's good. Yeah, it, he wasn't. He wasn't charged with going to hell. He wasn't. He was not. <laughs> was, no. They're no. like, well, because of these statements of heresy, one must yep. be condemned to hell. We have decided that it is so. Yep. Yeah. Well, that's beautiful. I think that's really profound. Just like that's just a good statement for everything. Like you know, I don't know, like with the whole, you know, if you're, um, my prayer is that you're, you know, the best Hindu you can ever be. You know, <laughs> like our best Muslim. And uh. Yeah, I appreciate that. I'm gonna be the yeah. best Micah I can be, you know. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> I want that too, Micah. God's like, Micah, you can get to, you can come to heaven. You tried, you you were the best Micah the virgin that you could be. The best so, Micah that could uh, Micah. Can you Micah though? <laughs> Turn into a verb. Say, I, the the thing that I will say is that I, I will the thing that I, the thing that I learned most profoundly in my own faith and in my own faith journey is that um, I actually think, I actually think, uh, I just looked up nervously at the heavens. I actually <laughs> think that I, my goal is not really so much about getting into heaven or, or avoiding hell. It's about trying to live the lives that we have right now as though god's kingdom god's peaceable kingdom were present here already um mm. and and for me that is um if there's anything that i that that's what i'm hoping to to do in terms of how i how i live how i walk um how i minister um yeah so I, i'm you... so micah quite frankly i'm not worried about you going to heaven or hell I, i'm worried about <laughs> how you're doing right now well, that's nice. You should be worried about me. You should be praying for me, actually. Uh, you know. You know, I've heard I'll, there's a podcast I'll, about this. Yeah, that's there's this thing where there 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 are there are masses out there. Are they are praying for me? Oh, my sweet mother, I love her so much. Shout out to Shari Crispin. She sent me a Happy Valentine's Day like meme or you know like one of those mm -hmm. social media cards. Is like, just remember on this day. The, of love that jesus loves you you know i was like at least one does at least right. <laughs> i may not have a woman who loves me but you know what i got you got you boo jesus is like i got you boo i love you and my mom's like i want i want i want i want you to remember that my god <laughs> it was sweet my mom does that i've been single on many of valentine's days over the years and so Oh geez. I always get I always get like a little, you know, sometimes my mom would be like, here's a little card, you know, happy Valentine's Day. We're all praying uh -huh. for you. We're praying, we're oh, praying God. for your future wife. We're praying, praying that <laughs> Yes, because it well, happens. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. That's one must be praying for. Um, yeah, no, I, I'm always thankful for it. Yeah, like I, I say it's like a tongue in cheek thing, but you know, like I said. I'm it's not always nice to be thought no one, of. Yeah, like I just my parents are thinking about me. Yeah, and they are. I like to conflate the numbers. It's really <laughs> just them that are praying for me. You know, <laughs> there are nope. a couple of atheists out there that have um, that have almost like oh, I might start praying now. Actually, <laughs> after after hanging out with my guy, I, I might actually. Uh, we, we've got a couple. Prayer. We've got a couple of people at OPPC who are praying for you. <laughs> yeah, there we go. Thank you. <laughs> you know, and. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I just uh I'm curious like though with your spiritual like journey, um did you when did it when did you discover or did you feel kind of called, you know, when you came back to the states that you're going to be a pastor no. or was it no, like no, you no. wanted to keep I, doing I was, missions? Like No. So when we got back to the US, I was getting ready to head head off to college and um what I knew was that I I was drawn towards service like that. That was kind of the air that I breathed. Um, but I also made a lot of really, really um, 
powerful promises to myself and to anybody who asked me if I would become a pastor. No, no. Uh, I, I saw how the sausage was made. Um, like, <laughs> I know, like, I did not walk into church thinking everything's all sunny because I love the church. I love the people of the church, but the people of the church are still people. Sure. Um, and and so I, I never thought I would I, I would go into ministry. Um, but as I went to college, I was looking at maybe doing uh, uh, journalism, but I realized I really didn't like getting up in people's faces uh, and constantly asking them questions. Um, I looked at uh, perhaps doing, going, I, I had one language under my belt, French. I thought about learning Arabic and maybe seeing about going and working for the State Department um, and like getting a degree in that, uh, in, in that, but realized that if I did that, I would have to represent the interests of the United States government <laughs> and not necessarily the country that I was stationed at and realized that I don't translate. think that I could do that with You'll have to translate. Yeah, I, like, I saw this meme. It was so funny. It was like, there was a TikTok video. Actually, it was like, I don't know. It's this whole people have been recutting. It's just a you know one of those template things. But it's like someone like in the desert like pulls up like a handful of oil out of the sand, and it's like immediately like this, knock knock, motherfucker. It's the United <laughs> States of America. Uh, exactly. Turn off that gas stove. Or else we will have to, you know, we'll have right. to, we'll threaten to bring you democracy. And I just picture like, that's what it was. <laughs> They're like, now translate to them and, and their language, turn off the stove, <laughs> or we'll have to you know, bless you with the, the pleasure of democracy <laughs> and bring you, come get your oil. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that, uh, uh, that, that kind of took me in a different direction. Um, so then I started, the other thing I had always thought was that I would be uh, a teacher. And so I started uh, going down the education track. And because I knew French already and I was lazy, I got my French degree and was getting my education degree. And I was, I was in the classroom and I was enjoying it. Um, and I knew I would enjoy working with kids because during the summers I worked at uh, Heartland Center, which is our local Presbytery um, camp. And I loved working with kids and hanging out with them and just getting tackled by 30 in the pool as they try to dunk you and get <laughs> severe neck pain that is now creeping up on me. Um, but but I really I really enjoyed that work. So I was like, you know, what, teaching sounds sounds really good. And I was in my apartment and my then girlfriend now wife was was in there and she's like well you're in the classroom now how how is that and I, I said you know i'm enjoying it but but there it feels like there's something missing and she was like oh well what do you think that is jason and i was like you know i think that what it is is that when i'm when i'm there in the classroom i'm there to teach a subject um like and, and that's like that's my role I, i'm the uh, I'm a teacher. They're there to learn a language. I'm there to teach it. And I, mm. I don't have the space to actually care for the entire kid. Like I've, I've got to, I've got to do this thing and, and I can be part of a system, but I can't, th there are real boundaries that I have to cross or that, that I can't cross in order to, to do that. And she, she looked at me and she's like, so what do you think that means? <laughs> and that was when I I began swearing profusely, and I said, <laughs> "I have to go to seminary, don't I?" Oh God! <laughs> ah, shakes fists at the heavens. <laughs> right. <clears throat> I was like, I, it was, um, yeah, and it was, uh, and, and the reality is, is that it was, it was wonderful. Like I, I served for. I, I, while I was while I was in seminary, I went to St. Paul School of Theology when it was in kind of the old northeast part of Kansas City. So I was I was near Shout your out to the northeast. Ground. Yeah, shout out to the northeast. I, I served at uh, Eastminster Presbyterian Church, which was up on Benton and just south of St. John's. Um, uh, it, church is closed now, but I was the the youth pastor there and worked with Haitian immigrants where my French and Creole came in handy. I worked with um, 
I worked oh, with cool. immigrants from uh, the uh, from the Sudan. It was uh, and with you know kids from the inner city and like we had this youth group where we went and did stuff and we learned from each other and it was it it was it was really really good um mm. and i for those graduated... listening it's also northeast kansas city northeast historic northeast neighborhood of kansas city missouri yes in case there's like any new york friends or people who are like not the north <laughs> i just remember like some people would be like confused like you live in the northeast and i was like i thought you're right. from kansas city and i'm like well now that's <laughs> Well, it's, and that part it's of a Kansas neighborhood, City, a historic neighborhood, yeah. Right, and that part of Kansas City was just um, that was also near the Guadalupe Center, which is an immigration settlement uh, right. center for for that part of the um, for Kansas City. So we just had enormously diverse, wonderful things, which is why when I graduated from seminary, I, I had a nice long chat with God about where I think I should be called to go. Uh, and I said, you know, I got another language in me I could learn. Uh, so, you know, I, could, I can do city work. I can do like, but I don't think, I don't think I, my talents are best suited for like a small rural community or a place like Overland Park, Kansas. And <laughs> just guess what my first two calls were. <laughs> uh, rural community and. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh -huh. yes. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Yeah. Did it, so, yeah. Did you have to like learn country speak <laughs> in a different language? What, you're like, actually, no. What I had to learn, what I had to learn there is, is that what I learned there was that we are so good at at dividing ourselves along numerous visible and invisible lines like there was so elwood had been a really small town for for a really long time it's elwood is probably about 20 minutes south of joliet if you remember the blues brothers elwood and joliet jake that's where they got the names from uh oh, huh <laughs> i don't know them but i was like oh that's it you haven't seen fame, the blues I will, brothers i don't think so i don't oh also, just don't ask me music references. I'm pretty bad about, okay. you know. <laughs> I I won't. Uh, That's the pray for Mike. He was homeschooled. You... He doesn't know music. <laughs> I'm sure if he played me a song, I'd be like, oh, okay, I know that, you know. <laughs> but I never know artists or I, titles of things. I I'm gonna get better one... though. I have a re I have a record player now, so now I'm actually like being intentional. Like, okay, there are artists that I like. I buy this album. I know the songs on the album. I know who did the recordings. You know, it's cool. I'm a full hipster um, now. <laughs> full you got the beard, you got the mustache. The oh, yeah. Mustache. Well, it just seems like one of those things that I probably should have had a record player a long time ago. But I was telling a friend, I was like, it felt like it was like tarot card deck rules where you're not allowed to go buy a tarot deck. It has to be given to you first. And so right. once friends give it to you. So this was given to me by my friend, Scott. He's like my uh -huh. co-worker here in Asheville. Uh -huh. he, just, he was like, oh, do you listen to records? I was like, yeah, back at home, I had friends who had records and stuff. I was like, I don't have one, though. And he's like, oh, why don't you have one? I was like, I basically gave him this whole spiel. I was like, it just felt like something that you inherit, you know, like a grandpa passes. <laughs> and like, hey, you want grandpa's old record? Play? Like, it just didn't feel right to like. And I'm like, thank you for blessing me now with this curse, Scott, because now I realize how expensive records are. I'm like spending like 20 bucks, 50 bucks sometimes of like. Which means that you appreciate it that much more. Right. I was like, well, I want an original Beatles white album. It just felt like you got to have some of the classics. Yeah. And I spent like 40 bucks on that. Just said, like, thanks for giving me a hobby that now costs me extra money. I hate you. <laughs> but it's so much fun. He comes over with yeah. his wife and they're just like, we'll just do the, I like the game or it's not a game, but the, the whole, we're like, all right, you pick out three. Like if I have a friend over or somebody like, uh -huh. All right, pick out three records and we'll listen to them back to back in whatever order you want to listen to them. It's fun. Anyways, that That's was my awesome. tirade. Apparently, I need to listen That's... to the Blue, the Blues Brothers. No, watch the, Brothers... the Blues Brothers. Oh, watch the Blues Brothers. It's a movie. Oh, okay. I'm sorry I let you go on so long. It's Dan Aykroyd. Like, actually, actually, Mikey, you don't even know. <laughs> We're not even having the same conversation, actually. <laughs> 
I just heard blues and brothers, and I just thought this was a music thing. <laughs> so. Nope. It's okay. It's okay. You can cut this out if you need to. Oh no, we're leaving it in. This is that. This is that full fledged just mic oh. awkwardness that I I let run wild. Yeah, you promise? Yeah. Oh uh, no. Anyways, continue. This was the towns. Yeah. So well, the the reality is is that, it, and as pastor, like I came in, I was twenty nine. Um, it, there's a surreal experience where you know, first time, first call pastor, twenty nine years old, walking in to a space where um, I was both an interloper newcomer um, that, and I got that vibe from, from people, not in my church, like my church folks, they were so happy uh, to have me and Melissa be there. Um, but like within the town, there, there were elements that were like, new people are ruining the old city <laughs> spirit because a, a subdivision had gotten built 20 years prior um and right the subject that was built 20 years ago it's still ruining the place <laughs> right it still ruined the place well and, and 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 within our the thing that was fascinating is that within within the community it, it becomes really easy i think i learned my mistake that um that being able to work cross-culturally would not be important and helpful to navigate a small town. Um, and, and that was the, the reality is it was just one of those reinforcers. I got so used to seeing external differences or cultural that, that the more subtle things still really matter to people. Uh, and that if you don't pay attention to that, um, things can inadvertently blow up in your face. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm curious, uh, like, with just these different kind of going from living on an island where the dodo bird, the great dodo died, uh, <laughs> to having these, yeah, just unique experiences, like, again, from working in the Northeast neighborhood of Kansas City, to working mm -hmm. rural, and, and now in OPPC, like, has there been like, I guess, what was like the spiritual kind of like arcs that you were kind of identifying in yourself? Was there ever like a point where you're like, I don't know, questioning your faith or like, like, should I be doing this? Was there, I mean, it sounds like you were, I know that you were like, all right, I'm leaving the school thing, the teaching thing. I'm going to like pursue right. this thing. But was there ever a moment that's like, I don't know, maybe I should go do something else or like mm. oh, maybe I should have gone back to being a teacher or work at a Presbyterian university or something. I don't know. I guess I'm just curious. Like I want, I want the juicy gossip. You, 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 know? you want, you want, you want the juicy, the juicy I want I want, I want to hear the, what was the struggle bus part. I don't know. Just like, I just feel like everybody, um, I, and you're a very wise person. And I feel like wisdom comes from being a person who's willing to question and assess <laughs> where they're at, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And like, and so I'm just curious, um, like, was there ever like a family? Cause I just, I saw that with my parents too, like questions of like their walk and their journey in ministry of like how it was affecting family and the kids and mm. the, the drain it could be. I don't know. I'm kind of all over the place. Decipher what you will from that question. I've yeah. So rambled. the thing, the thing that I struggled with more the thing that I struggled with most uh, was, was, oh my gosh, this this is not gonna make this is not gonna make you feel good. <laughs> and I'm sorry, um, but after you oh. left OPPC, um, there there was a period of about a year there where, um, and it wasn't because you left; it was just at that is. point. It, it, well, it was it was COVID, and what became really really clear to me as um, as a person of faith and my own spirituality is that what I need in in spirituality is embodiment. Uh, mm -hmm. 
I need to be with people. I need to be walking with people. And the isolation that we experienced collectively as at, during COVID, um, it, it really did, uh, it really pushed me to the limits of what I felt like I was able to do. Um, and so doing like virtual church services, doing, doing virtual church yeah. services. I, I, I'm, I'm afraid in, in this, do I struggle with my faith and do I have questions about my faith? Yes, absolutely. Um, do I think about doing anything else? Um, if I have to go back to COVID church, that might be the de death of your ministry life, <laughs> that, like, <laughs> or your your pursuit of doing ministry. I mean, it was pastoral role, I should say. The, well, the you'll probably is, continue doing ministry of some sense, but maybe right. being you're like, uh, I don't know if I want to do this virtual church nonsense. Yeah, you know? and that that was really I, things <clears> got <throat> a lot better once we were able to meet and be like separated and like. But just meeting together, I realized what was just, um, again, I think it has to do with that whole, the, the idea of the incarnation of God being present with us, of walking with us and being with us, and that that's what church is called to summon us into. Um, I, th I think we are given each other, a, we are given, we are given the gift of each other. Um, and to not be able to gather, to not be able to to be in the same space uh, was was deeply painful and, and hard. Um, but um, I mean, here this is really I don't know how to say this other than part of my undergraduate degree was reading all of the French existentialist atheists. <laughs> <laughs> um, like I read all of them. I understand all of them, but at the end of the day, they kind of left me cold. And, and, you know, at the end of the day, I was like, this is a way to live. This is a way that can be a good way to live, but this is not the way that, that I am being called to. Um, this is the way I, this is not the way this is the way. Right. Yeah. I've this, done a Mandalorian bit. <laughs> yep. Oh yeah. Well, uh, I, I will say there have been many times when I have quoted the man before. <laughs> I was gonna say I'm just like we well we both spoke that dirty language, you know. Talk the talk dirty, dirty to me. Talk <laughs> talk, talk dirty. dirty to me. Yeah, talk talk dirty nerdy to me at work, you know. Oh yeah. Um, so I'm I'm sorry to disappoint that I don't have much juice there. Um, I I think. Mm, but I hear I, you. Like that was a hard time, and and that's enough to like affect. Yeah, anybody who's like mm -hmm. that. There's a deep connection that comes from being with people, and that's. I mean, there's a, not a coincidence that I started my therapy, uh, seeing a therapist for like two years during the pandemic because yeah, I felt, I felt that isolation, I felt that loneliness, and also was like, well, when you're alone, boy, do you have some demons you got to face? You know, you can't run around <laughs> avoiding that shit. You got to like face it. Okay, I guess it's time to go meet with yeah. somebody and, and talk through it. You know. And I'm I glad you were able to find enough, something. Yeah, I was fortunate enough to be able to. Yeah, it was tough to find. Well, you were the one who recommended somebody to me. That ever, <laughs> you know. I do. Shout out to Elise in the Overland Park. Woo -woo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I basically graduated. I'm healed. You know. I don't know. I'm just kidding. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> I moved. I moved out of state. So then I was like, she was like, "Well, I'm not certified there. So I guess well, we're done." I'm like. Does this mean I'm healed? Does this mean <laughs> I've graduated? She was just like, oh, no, brother. I'm praying for oh, you, actually. No. <laughs> She's like, I'm praying that you find oh, a therapist there in Asheville. She lordy, is, lordy. <laughs> she is so lovely. No, I think we got to a good place that was like, okay. I was having less panic attacky life, you know, a yeah. little less anxiety. And taught me with some great self-management um, approaches to, like, you know, just everything, work, yeah. business, family, ba balance, life, just the whole thing. And you know how it is mm -hmm. with family. They're always just like, you're talking about me in those sessions, aren't you? And I'm like, well, of course, because, you know, that's how therapy is. But I'm also talking right. about me and my relation to the world I live in. 
into the relation of my family and friends and everybody. Right. But it's always just yeah. like, yep. When your parents, you just kind of imagine you must feel this way with your kids. Like they're going to just grow up and talk about how damaging I was to them. <laughs> just gonna... Oh, Melissa. See, <laughs> see this. Melissa and I were really, really clear that being, being the grandchildren of Joe and Becky, the son and daughter of, uh, uh, of Melissa and Jason, they were going to need therapy. And so what we tried to do <laughs> is instill specific traumas so that we, we could plan what kind of therapy that they would need. That's genius, actually. I like that. That's like, no, no, we were like surgical <laughs> with our trauma. We were like, we were, like, we were precise with it. We were like, <laughs> we were like, anxiety? <laughs> Now, when you go to your therapist, here's your checklist. What? Now, now you know what you need to go work on. This is this is what you need to go work on. This is our gift to you. There's this no mystery gift. involved. <laughs> yeah, there's no put me under psychosis. And that one time, I couldn't even remember that happened. You know, like no, no. My parents gave me a list. They were like, go and seek your therapy now. Like. <laughs> Oh, yeah, I'm so on that, on that note, how do you balance uh, family and, like, I guess I'm curious, too, just, like, mm. you know, I imagine you, you probably raise your kids with kind of an openness to let them explore their spirituality. Was there ever, like, thoughts or opinions where your kids were like, Mom, Dad, is God just kind of, like, bullshit or whatever, <laughs> you know? And, like, how did you navigate that? Or, you know, were you, like, a, you know... You know, ask all the questions. They're all found in this mm -hmm. book called the Bible. Oh. <laughs> <You know? laughs> uh -huh. All right. I guess, like, how did you go about that raising kids and them knowing that they're in, you know, a pastor's home? Coming from a pre PK kid myself, you know. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I feel you. I feel you. I feel you, brother. <laughs> yeah. You, you've got multiple generations. I, I also oh, yeah. <laughs> come uh, from that, from generational. Yeah, we just families. we just had, again. We also need to stress how different our household oh, was. 100%, my yeah. father, yeah, my father bought me my first D and D set when I was ten. <laughs> my family was like, "That's witchcraft. We need a band yep. from the, the church." Yep, and they're yep. still not unsure that there's not like real spells in it. You know, like they're just like, "I'm pretty sure they're <laughs> oh. the kids at the D and D dungeons and their little house that they're probably you know walking away I with." I'm physically there, ill. I there, think I've got a curse. There are times in D and D. Have you played D and D before? I can't remember. Oh yeah, I've been on a okay. involved in a couple camp campaigns. I haven't played in years, but well, I, there, I, I didn't there start are days. Twenties, you know. <laughs> yeah. So so I actually run a a campaign for a bunch of uh, pastor friends and myself. Uh, and there are days when we all kind of look at the guy who's playing a cleric, and we're like only i had the power to smite evil oh my gosh i've got some evil that needs smiting right now <laughs> you can just imagine you can just imagine a bunch of presbyterian pastors going oh my god just i just once. want to smite evil i just want <laughs> to smite me, evil i just want to smite evil please well, all these pastors well, just oh, jonesing for smiting evil <laughs> that's right well, it, 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 and here's the thing, to not to bring the conversation completely down. He, here's the thing. Like, I recognize that that thing in myself, but then I ha also have to go back to, like, the horror of what happened yesterday, right? And, like, the whole, the whole desire for, for vengeance of righteous anger, like, those are real things. Um, and there are, like, I'm... I'm so mad, um, mm. as I shared. Um, but like there, there is a space for for the anger <clears throat> that can propel you towards action. And I think that too often we think of violence as it's the shortcut to get what we want, rather than all it does is continue breaking the world. Um, it's just anyway. Yeah, I guess on that note, like going back to yeah. like raising your kids and trying to yeah. instill like faith in this construct of a loving God who allows for all whatever sovereignty purposes 
allows things like what happened in Kansas City to happen and does intervene. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Have you ever had any of your kids come to you and be like, yeah, mom and dad, like, why doesn't God like stop this shit? And you know, yeah, I just, I just I had think, free I will. Think... And I don't know. I know that that's generally like the kind of conversations you was like, well, because God wanted us to be able to choose him. He also allows us to not choose him and pursue evil. But it's just sometimes it's hard to wrap your head around that um, idea it... of like a sovereign God who just like can kind of turn a cold shoulder to like that kind of suffering in the world. And there's, yeah, I, I completely, like, I, I completely agree. It is, it is really hard, hard to square that. Um, for me, w- while, again, for any Presbyterians who might, li- who might be listening, I, I believe in a sovereign God. Um, but I, I do think, wink, Wink. No, I'm just kidding. No, 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 no. I believe in a sovereign God. You you believe in a sovereign God? No, I don't. I just felt Um, like you were like, what's this disclaimer for? In case there's any Presbyterians listening. (laughs) Yeah. No, the primary, the primary, I think, I think the characteristic, though, that, that is primary for God is that it is sovereign love uh, with an emphasis on love. And when I think about what love has to be, it cannot be compelled. Um, like I can't force, I, I, I could try to force my kids to love me, um, but I can't. Um, it has to be something that is shown to them and, and delivered to them. Um, I don't think that this explains evil, um, but I think it, exp- it there is no explanation. Mm, what we saw yesterday is simply sin um it, it, and we don't we haven't heard any of the reasons or or the whys but quite frankly at, at the end of the day it's just this is human brokenness whether it's sure. it's anger or vengeance or just stupidity and uh just the i mean you know it could be that I mean, guns are so prevalent right now. It would not surprise me if somebody saw somebody else have had a gun, shouted "gun," and then somebody sh- grabbed the gun, shot somebody. Like, yeah. and then suddenly there's a free for all. Um, yeah, we don't totally. know. Um, but what I don't believe, and I think again, I, I have a high regard for scripture. Scripture never proclaims that God is a fairy godmother, that mm. God comes down and just says, bibbidi bobbidi boo, bink. Um, it's that's that is not how God has ever interacted uh, with the world. Um, God, God has always said, has always summoned us to follow, to to delve into discipleship, um, to follow the pattern. I mean, for me, following the pattern of Jesus, um, the way, the way of peace, the way to the cross, this, this is the way for the world to be healed. Um, and I'm called to participate in that, um, as to why evil happens. It's because sometimes people are mean Mm. or hard hearted or greedy um and why god doesn't i don't know um but i do know and this this is a faith knowing that that at its core um we are called into love yeah yeah i i heard someone say once that um if we just broaden like a little bit of the definition of God to just all that is all, you know, I don't know. That's kind of my faith construct, my view of the universe of just like, I don't know, just like the cells of our body somehow make up this organism that is mica, but you know, they're all kind of doing their own little mm-hmm. thing, all these little mm-hmm. <laughs> quirks and uh-huh. sound waves and all this weird shit that's happening. So atomic particles and like there's this emergence that is mica and like, I don't I don't necessarily believe he's that. He's beautiful. <laughs> he is he's an epic. 
He is an beautiful. epic person. I'm just gonna try to be the best Micah I can be. That's you what my are. cells are saying. How do I how do I be the best Micah? Um, I, like, and I don't necessarily believe in the idea that God's even like this emergence of a person. It's just mm-hmm. all that is the universe, all that is is somehow wrapped up in this emergence that is mm-hmm. um what is. You know, we could live in a world mm-hmm. in a universe that none there's nothing, and we happen to be in a universe that there's something. There's a lot of something. <laughs> And that yeah, this is this is, is God. Lot. This is God. Yeah. This is the universe type thing. And when you look at it, and like, you know, when we look at the stars and the cosmos, and there's a lot of death out there. There's actually just a lot of shit mm-hmm. that would kill us. Mm-hmm. And uh and yet from the death of these particles or things, gas giants and this and that, uh, we get other stars, we get other constellations, you know, these you know, super clusters. And I don't know, you just, you realize that like the universe is both, um, you know, I don't even want to break it down to the binaries of good, bad, or it's love and pain and suffering, but it is all that is. And while we have found ourselves in a world where we are thinking autonomous creatures and we can choose whether Mm -hmm. to participate in, acts of violence that are traumatizing and and generationally um havoc like detrimental to our people and to our our lives our kids Mm -hmm. when we choose against that kind of operation in the world like you said we're, we're following what christ was trying to share which was like oh don't just love your your friends and family or the people you like like love your enemies actually too yeah and yeah. trying to like institute policies that are not policies, but like principles that um, are counterintuitive that then just like if we just want to get caught up into the evolutionary cycle of uh, this is my my village people. These are my tribesmen. I will I will kill your tribesmen and we will <laughs> we will do this. These are my chiefs people. Oh, you want to fight me and my chiefs? <laughs> right. You know, I'm not right. saying that that's what they're about, but that's basically we have now tamed tribalism to like sports. And that's what. <laughs> <laughs> which is why I'm like the worst sports fan in the world. Cause I just don't have that like drive. That's like, yeah, go, go. My, my I, robust men. These are my men who have red. They wear red. <laughs> Having so, grown up in Northern red. Wisconsin, I, I occasionally pay attention when I hear the name Packers. Um, <laughs> right. And other than that, um, I really like cheese and bratwurst. Yeah. I basically just played up like, I live, yeah, I live in Asheville now, so I was like, uh-huh. I had friends over, and I was excited to be like, they were like, oh, shit, we know a guy from Kansas City. Micah, we got to watch the game with you. You're These are your people. <laughs> and I'm like, people. these these are your people, sir. <laughs> like, And I'm like, yep. you oh, and let, Mahomes. Me just, let me, let me just turn good. on, let me just switch on that, like, Fairweather fan uh, switch real quick. All right. That's right. I am from Kansas City. Let's do, right. let's do. I don't have barbecue, but we will do. <laughs> we will do some good food. Yeah, we do have barbecue. It's just not as good. I figured you. I was like, that doesn't sound like North Carolina. I mean, I just we didn't buy barbecue for the ah, Chiefs ah. game. Yeah, watch it. Anyways, I all that to say that like, I, I just like what even like yeah the little nugget that you said of your your dad like, you know I pray that they're the best Hindu that they can possibly be. Yeah, and I I'm for that. And yeah. Um, yeah, and just thinking about your spiritual journey and everything, like, yeah, I, there's a lot of light and love we can give each other, and we also just have to accept that, like, again, from the worldview that I'm coming from, that, like, there just is this death and destruction, and if that is, you know, I, I, yeah, like I said, I don't know if I can look at my body when a cell dies and judge my whole body as a person, like, well, why didn't you do something about it, Micah? (laughs) Does that make sense? Like, uh, why didn't you, why didn't you help out that one, that one brain cell or, you know, a few hundred million that you've killed already with this one glass of alcohol? Like, how dare you, you sovereign Micah, like kill sovereign (laughs) Micah. That's a sovereign, a sovereign over my, my cell structures or my body. Like, would you you like the crown? Yeah, give me give I've me got the a Burger King, King crown. crown here. <laughs> I don't know. Does that make sense though? Like the idea of like, no, 
you know, if there's a God who started the flow of these events and it all is encompassed in this great mysterious universe, and it's all this emergence of properties and life and things, mm -hmm. can we really judge that thing for when the I think, uh, solar I, I, flare destroys our whole planet or something, or when like, you know, an asteroid hits us, you know what I mean? Can we like judge uh, well, the what, thing what itself I say for being evil, you know? For me, the being... question the question for me is always is always what am I going to be doing right here, right now? Um, the the whole as much as I wish I could, I can't do anything about the solar flare. Um, <laughs> like I or I, the tsunamis, for that matter, right? You or get or the saying, tsunamis, like, or, the things, or or natural disasters. Naturally, I, I cannot. We do could do something things. of global warming, but we won't. <laughs> the uh, cu culture and world, but that's another. Yeah, side. that's. I don't think we've got another hour and a half to talk about that. Yeah, I was gonna say I have recycle. I do recycle, <laughs> and it is pointless. <laughs> <sighs> that's the end of that. That's the end of that conversation. No, I don't want to end on a downer. I want to end on a positive note. So you, yeah, you yeah. bring us out of this. You bring me out of this. Uh, this existential part of the conversation that I'm going <laughs> about. <laughs> well, I mean, hmm. I think from 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 my own perspective, uh, from my own perspective as, as a as a Presbyterian pastor, um, I think the thing that um, I will quote the best Presbyterian pastor that I know, which is Fred Wa Fred Rogers, right? Um, who, when 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 he asked his mom, you know, what do we, when it when he got scared because something scary happened, his mom told him, you know, look for the people who are running to help. There are always helpers. There are always people who are moving to do that. And so I think that is one of the things that we have to bear in mind is that, you know, there were people, there were unarmed people who tackled mm -hmm. the guy who, or yeah. whoever it was, uh, who was shooting people. Um, there were hundreds of ambulance workers, of nurses and doctors who were tending to victims. Now, they should not have to be doing that. But they did. But, but they did, um, yeah, and and they were needed, and for the people who are hurt, and for the people who will walk with them through through the next couple months, years as they recover from the trauma that they've that they've endured, um, they they are the healing agents of God in the world. Um, you know whether they think about it that way or not. That's my like. That's my perspective, um, totally. and I am grateful for them. And may we all just pursue some element in our own lives of being healing agents of some aspect yeah. of the world. You know, like that's beautiful. You know, if we have a world we don't understand, it's full of death and suffering and life and love. Like, if we can just be some version of being light to and love to um, people around us. Um, and like you said, not, not even just like, you know, we, we were talking about nonviolence at the beginning, but really like, I think Martin Luther King talked about like that peace is not necessarily the absence of mm -mm. Uh, violence, but it's, it is the presence of justice, something along those lines. And like, it, it, it is talking about like, and, like, not it is, uh, yeah, that putting yourself in harm's way, like you're saying, and being able to resist evil is part of this framework of justice. Um, yeah. So it's just not this, like, passive, like, well, let me just be run down by the tanks, you know, uh, or right. the thing that's um, subduing or, sub you know, putting pressure on a people. Like, peace, being a peacemaker is putting yourself in the midst of that and... Um, that doesn't necessarily mean you're just being all kumbaya. You're kumbaya. Yeah, you're gonna, right. no, you're gonna, it, you're gonna resist, and resistance means friction and and violence. You know, sometimes. Yeah, but when we start talking about nonviolence, that is the intentional work that you are doing. You're saying, I'm gonna try and put myself between other people who are getting hurt, 
and those who are doing the harm. And by my example, show that, you know, I, I'm, I will take the blows that you're trying to, that, that are going to be meant for them. And mm -hmm. I'm going to try and resist. And I will take the consequences of that, of that thing. And I will show the world by my actions exactly how ugly the violence is. Totally. And like that, that it was, I took a class in seminary or not in seminary, actually in college on the history of nonviolence. And that was the thing that like, that I heard time and time again, as we read Martin Luther King Jr., as we read Howard Thurman, like the reality is the fight is actually not, and this was always interesting to me about the, about a lot of the civil right, le mm -hmm. civil rights leaders is that the fight is not with the people. The fight is against the violence mm. and we cannot overcome violence with more violence. Um, totally. That, that will not um, work. And I also want to acknowledge there are limits to that. Like there are limits to, to what you can accomplish with that. But um, sure. Yeah. Yeah. When, yeah, policies and institutions and things are designed to create not just like temporary street violence, you know, but like systemic, like life violence. Exactly. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. like people dying in their 60s because they have diabetes and no health insurance and they live in a chronically yep. impoverished neighborhood, disinvested, you know, you get it. Like, yep. you can see the all whole... these things as, as acts of violence against the person. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's why it's like I'm convinced that even if there is a you know civil war in America based on like politics, I think at some point it'll just subdue and we'll end up just like killing the rich or something. <laughs> like I just think it'll just end up being like we'll just end up like I'm just saying like the really dark times. Like if there's like there's a movie coming out here in a few months, I'm like I know on a political on a political like a, a presidential election year, I'm like what irresponsible people are doing this like yeah. <laughs> just like gonna put out a movie called civil war and it's about a modern day american civil war you were asking about how how i manage uh to balance family life and um and work and and everything else um when it when the kids were younger it was it was a little harder um, because I, little kids, they just need your attention. The, the thing that I was really fortunate in, and actually I've been fortunate in both of the churches that I've been called to is that they understood that my role as a father was, was paramount. Um, and so for instance, when, when I first came to Overland Park Presbyterian, the, the church knew that I had a nine month old and a three year old and mm -hmm. that having a having you know seven committee meetings every month that that was a week away from my from from family time and so they they organized it that all of the committees of the church met on sun one sunday afternoon after church and then basically i hopped from committee to committee and each committee had me for like 10 15 minutes to give any input that they felt that I needed. And then I went to the next one and the next one and the next one. And they did that because the, they, they knew that my, my time with my family was, was important and they honored that. Um, I have been, I have been incredibly fortunate in both of my congregations that they understood how important that was. Um, when, when Rossum was born, Melissa had, you know, three months off from work and then she had to go back to work. And Rosalind basically was with me in my church office uh, from nine until three every single day. And uh, I had a I had a group of of uh, church ladies who if I got called to the hospital, I could drop Rosalind off with and they would they would watch her and be delighted. and. Um, I think I know that that is not the case for 
for many pastors that they, they that many pastors have not experienced that kind of that kind of grace and that kind of understanding. And so again, I have been um, it, it is the thing that makes it is that kind of thing that makes serving in churches um, able to serve with your whole heart. I don't have to divide my heart in different ways because the church actually cares for the well-being of of my family. Um, and I'm not just an employee. Um, and, and I know one of the one of the things that we had talked about is, you know, how do we how does a church create a an atmosphere of inclusion? And I think mm -hmm. that that's actually a really that is one of the most important parts uh, of how we do that is that we um, we make space for the whole person. Um, I'm not interested in in just what happened to you with your success. Um, it, you know, at G I read Jesus as saying, I want your whole heart. I want the wholehearted person. And there is no wholehearted person who has not been broken, um, either by trauma of somebody else's doing or of their own doing. And and yet just continues to to summon us in. And when communities do that, they become havens of of safety and grace um, and joy. Yeah. And may we all be so lucky to have such incredible parents who give us that trauma and very precise precision cuts on a list that we can take to our therapist. That's you right. Know, may we be so lucky. <laughs> we Jason, all hope. It's been such a pleasure talking with you. Yeah, just thanks. And it was in your you're you're still on my top my top list of bosses I've had. You're you're probably honestly one of the yeah, you're probably my best one. As far as just like the fun that we had together in the office, you know. Um, I don't know what you're talking about. There were about. other bosses we that paid me sober. better, but no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Not kidding, but you know, it was yeah. on church salaries. That's how you, you expect it, but you know. I mean, uh, Micah, yeah. I will say I always appreciated it when you looked at me and said, Jason, we need to focus. And I was like, yeah. This is why this is why we pay this you why I hired this moderately guy, yeah. sized bucks. <laughs> this is why I give them moderately sized bucks. That's funny. Jason, Jason, we have to stop talking about Star Wars or what Lord of the Rings or whatever it is. Like we have to focus now. Um well uh just because before we go, tell us anything yeah. coming up this year. Um mm -hmm. any projects you and the church are working on, or this is also kind of the time of the show I'd like to invite you to throw out the links share with us where people can find you and your church community online yeah they want to follow you and your your D, &D sessions if you do those <laughs> live streaming i don't know no <laughs> no no, no. we do not air those those we do are, not air those that is <laughs> those a safe are, space that's a safe space that's that's where you wear the real cloaks that's where you're in the basements you know <laughs> that's exactly right oh uh, no um so things that are coming up this year, I mean, we're in the <clears throat> we're in the throes of of Lent and preparing for Easter. One of the things that has been interesting is that our church is leasing space from a Lutheran church and another Lutheran church. So we now have three churches all worshiping together uh, during um, on Sunday mornings, and so that is an interesting and exciting thing where we're trying to navigate. Uh, tight spaces and worship schedules. Um, that that's actually kind of that's interesting and uh, challenging and exciting. Uh, we're continuing to do our, our breathing space uh, meeting that happens on on Thursday nights, uh, where we kind of gather in uh, for contemplative thing. We've got a two year old who comes. We've got uh, myself uh, and probably about four or five other people who are there most nights. And it's, it's wonderful. Uh, it's just a time where people can, well, they can take a breath in the middle of the week. Um, and uh, we That's are, nice. yeah, well, you've been there. You know what it's like. 
I've, I've gone there to breathe. You've but I do to. remember, like, it was tough during the pandemic. It's like, well, we had to come and breathe, but very separated with masks. You know? <laughs> yeah, it was. Yeah. That, like, that actually, was... we're not going to encourage breathing hard at this moment. Actually, actually, we would like you to do moderately breathing. <laughs> moderate, moderate breathing. <laughs> moderate breathing, please. Completely is... spread out. Um, it, was beautiful. it was beautiful, though. It was very, yeah. I like I like contemplative spaces like that. Now it's what yeah. is cool about working with you. Yeah. Yeah. And so uh, we're continuing to do that. Uh, we're really involved in uh, trying to support our schools um, that the local elementary schools we've been, we're doing a book drive for their libraries. Um, and we just, uh, we work with one of the schools has um, a program for, for kids who are uh, autistic. They're on the spectrum for, for autism and working to make sure that they've got this tools because of course no schools are, are fully funded in the way that they need. And so we're trying to help match those needs and, and help people uh, in that way. So those are the things we're really excited about. And, uh, and this Sunday we've got a potluck and a game day. So I'm bringing all of my board games. Oh, that sounds great. What's going to be your it's top gonna be game awesome. you're going to play? What's your, what's your go-to board Ooh. game? Well, so my go go to board game right now is probably in that, in that context, so yeah. right. Well, okay, my in that context, um, whatever I can get somebody else to play with me, um, <laughs> I, I'll I'll go I'll go for just about anything. Um, yeah. Uh, oh, and not that anybody. Uh, if anybody's in the Kansas City area, if you bring soup cans, you can vote for your favorite soup. All proceeds go to the Linwood United Food Pantry in uh, inner city Kansas City. So, <laughs> all right, nice. and that's that's actually where that's where I got this crown from uh, because <laughs> I won last year. Again, if you're on the YouTube side, you can see he's holding a, a very sad, kind of sad looking crown, but you know it is a crown. It is not. It, it's not it's, it's a not Burger nothing. King Halloween crown. It's yeah. got eyes. And yeah, it's actually it's actually pretty rad for a, for a cardboard crown, you know. <laughs> it's it's lasted about four years. <laughs> we we might need well, a new one. Yeah. Uh Jason, uh yeah, go ahead. Where can people find you online on what's the oh, website? Uh I know I could tell can, it, but go ahead and show share with people and a, yeah, you can it. find us at OP uh OP Presbyterian. Hold on. Overlandparkpress.org. Holy, you gotta get this. You gotta get your I pitch did get, down. Oh my gosh, what is wrong with me? That's why you paid me to do the marketing. You're like that <laughs> you, really you know the website, Micah. Go and build the thing for yeah, the website. It's Overland know? Park Prez. <laughs> Overland Park it's Prez. Overland Park Prez. Over the park press org. Could, uh, part of me wanted to be like yeah. OPPC as well, but I was like, no, that's not it. Right. I was like, Overland Park Press. It used to be work. that, but yeah, we changed it. Okay. And you can see design by Micah. Ooh. Oh, ho, ho. you can go there and see. Yeah, if you go visit <laughs> church, you can go see some banners I just designed for them recently a couple that's months right. ago. And yeah, you're the best. Yeah. Then I love how we were like, you're like, I don't know if we'll have a grid. Like, I don't know what we'll talk about. Hopefully we don't just you know, waste all the space in here. I've kept you for two hours <laughs> talking yeah. about all the things. So. I'm sure I'm sure you can cut some of this out. Um, I probably won't. If you're listening to this, it's probably it's I've probably shaved off five minutes or something. I don't know. I'm lazy like that. Like I said, people are paying for the Patreon version, even though I'm not getting Patreon money. <laughs> everyone's not getting the, everyone's getting the behind the scenes and the rough cuts all in one. You know? <laughs> well, thanks, Jason, right. for uh, being hey. here. Reverend Carl, everybody check out uh, over the Park Presbyterian Church. Until next time. Thanks for joining me for the Pray for Micah podcast. Be sure to like, subscribe, and leave a review. And check out my YouTube channel and follow me on social media. Pray for Micah Pod on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. We'll see you next time. You are now re-entering the normal world.